Um, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. And um, Valerie asked me to speak about um, what is called, or variously by some people, called public engagement. Now some people call it public involvement in science. And so the lecture is really in three parts of not equal length. The first one is to ask, why do scientists participate? Why do they decide to communicate to the public? Then I'm going to talk about my own experience. And then finally, I will try and use my own experience to draw a few more general conclusions, which you may or may not agree with, and you can, I hope we can discuss. So science lectures often have demonstrations. And so the question comes up, what makes a good demonstration? And the first thing is that it should be quite a clear and striking effect. I feel probably there should be an element of surprise, and it should also make quite a relevant scientific point. And also, most importantly of all, the audience has to feel that something might go seriously wrong. Or I hope that it will do. So um, what I thought I would do is this place really isn't set up to do chemistry demonstrations. So I would do what is more perhaps an engineering demonstration with a 20 pound note. I haven't changed it, it's still the same 20 pound note. And what you can do, watch carefully, is um, you can demonstrate that this note is really quite strong. You can pull very hard and it won't break. However, if you make a small nick, and um, I won't ask you to verify, but I've made a small tear in it. And then if you pull, it easily breaks into two. Um, now, before you get frightened, you can sellotape them back together and still spend them. So it's quite, <laughs> I haven't thrown away money. But what this demonstrates is a point about how things fail mechanically. And usually, if the metal on your car breaks or something like that, it's because there's a small crack. And when it's stressed, the um, <coughs> fracture goes along the start of this crack. It starts with a crack and propagates. And if I was giving a full chemistry lecture, I would then explain to you that if you add niobium element 41, I'm sorry, it's not on my tie, or it is, but it's round the back, so you can't see it. Um, if you add niobium to steel, and steel has, as in your car, is made up of grains which have grain boundaries, which are where cracks can start, that if you add a small amount of niobium, it doesn't dissolve in the steel, and it accumulates in these cracks and stops the crack propagating. So if you put 200 grams of niobium in the steel in your car, you can use 100 kilos less of steel and still have a car of the same strength. 100 kilos is the size of quite a hefty passenger. And so you can think in the lifetime of the car that <coughs> saves a lot of petrol. Now, I should also say that this demonstration is one that soon we won't be able to do because we're going to have all our banknotes going to be plastic. However, it turns out we now only have the one plastic um, note. Um, you can actually do some quite interesting experiments with plastic banknotes we tried last week. And um, if, you if you cool a plastic banknote with liquid nitrogen to minus... 196 centigrade, and then thump it with a hammer, it breaks. Um, unfortunately, this one, uh, we've, um, my colleagues lost this piece. So um, I just will keep this as a souvenir. I can't sellotape it together again. Um, by the way, it's not illegal to tear up banknotes. It may be stupid. 
uh, but it is illegal to, to paint moustaches and glasses on Her Majesty, but you can see she's okay. Um, what is perhaps most striking of all is that if you treat a new banknote with concentrated acid, you end up with this totally transparent piece of plastic, which is quite fun, but there's no way you will pass this off as a banknote. <laughs> now, we therefore come to the question, why do scientists participate in science communication? And they have um, quite strong pressures to do so. Um, which can be summed up with this phrase, duty to communicate with the public, which comes from a report by the Wolfendale Committee that was published just over 20 years ago. But now they're really quite strong, um, strong pressures. The Council for Science and Technology, which is chaired by the Prime Minister, has supported this. The Research Council, and the other funders of research tell researchers that they should be communicating with the public. Um, there's pressure from universities because they want their employees to satisfy the funders. And then, and that's an important point, there is a need to recruit students because, by and large, people who teach in universities need lots of students to come to their university. Otherwise, their salaries will not be justified. So these are the pressures on the, on the scientists. But the really question is, why do scientists actually participate? Now, because I don't know the answer to this question myself, but, well, I do know from my point of view, but not for others, and so, when you get to my age, if you don't know the answer to a question, the first thing you do is to ask your children. And very fortunately, in this case, <clears throat> my daughter has published, Ellen, has published a paper, What Factors Predict Scientists' Intention to, pub to Participate in Public Engagement of Science Activities. So you can have... Um, Ellen is a psychologist at the University of Manchester, so you can have a real scientific analysis of the problem. And what is, I think, interesting is particularly the reasons that are not very important why students uh, why um, scientists participate or not. One of the things that's interesting is that time constraints don't seem to be very important. People don't worry whether they have enough time to do it or not. Obviously, there must be some um, <coughs> constraint, but not very much. They also don't seem to worry very much about shortage of funding or the fact that they may not get huge career recognition. They won't get as much recognition if they communicate science as if they make some world-shattering discovery. But so what are the things that do influence them? One of the things is that if they've done it already, they're much more likely to do it again. You might say that's quite obvious. But on the other hand, people who've done something can be put off it for life. You know, they taste Coca-Cola once and they don't want to drink it again or whatever. So. Um, it's important whether they think it's a worthwhile activity, and it's important that they think they have the skills to do it. And it's also, there's a certain level of peer pressure that it's important that they think that their colleagues are doing it as well. So this is the theory. Let's now perhaps apply it in practice. Um, why did I start in public engagement? And so you have to go back a long time in my career. In 1974, I was working on the area called photochemistry, that are chemical reactions produced by light. And I was at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne. And this is the assembled staff in my 
department. In case you can't spot me, this is me. And you can see my hair was quite similar to what it is now, but different color. And the reason I started was rather prosaic that my sister, who's more than nine years younger than me, asked me to give her a lecture at a school in London. So I came down from Newcastle with a big box full of chemicals, something that would not now be allowed, especially on the train, as I think I came down with them. And I gave a talk about photochemistry, which was called the lighter side of chemistry <coughs> because it was chemistry with light. And so that was before I had started doing much teaching. And then um, now, uh, well, I mean, after that, I became a lecturer and started teaching chemistry. And here's a little video to explain about that. Well, I do quite a lot of teaching to the first year students. And um, I use dog toys to um, film, uh, to, to, to demonstrate them. It looks like a molecular model, but it's actually called a wiggly giggly. It, it actually looks just like a molecule of the shape of molecule of methane. And what's good is that I have to, I demonstrate to the students that if you rotate this through 120 degrees, it looks just the same. But what's nice is, you see, as you rotate it, it makes a noise. And this really quite excites the students. There's this one that I was using this morning. This one has squeaks like this. This, well, the, 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 this morning we were using this for a molecule that had three fluorine atoms here and two hydrogen atoms at the top, which really is this shape. And having something like this makes it fun for the students and they can enjoy. And I was showing them how the molecule bends like this and so on. So this is a new one that I just bought. And I'm not quite sure yet what I'm going to do. You can see it's square if you look at it that way. And um, so, but I've got six months or so before my lecture starts so I can start thinking what's the best way to get this in. But it's quite fun. So um, anyway, I brought a wiggly giggly to show you. And you can pass it round. So Jack, catch. So it's quite tough. It's designed for dogs, so it won't break easily. But try not to make too much noise with it. Um, so then, as Valerie mentioned, that as my career developed, I became interested in an area that's called green chemistry. This is cleaner approaches to making chemicals and materials. And the idea of the research is that you do something in the lab and then transfer it into industry. And the particular area that I was interested in, and I'm still interested in, is trying to replace the solvents that you use to dissolve chemicals, to do chemical processes. These are quite often are things that are environmentally not very <coughs> acceptable. And so we were working with so-called supercritical fluids, and we still work with them, which are potentially very much cleaner. And the supercritical fluid is a highly compressed gas, carbon dioxide or steam, which is compressed till it's nearly as dense as a liquid, and it can be used as solvent for chemical reactions. So, by the way, you can buy these at pet shops, so you, <laughs> you don't need to photograph it, you can have your own. Um, incidentally, I should say that when this video was made, the importer of Wiggly Gigglies into the UK was so excited that he sent me a box of a dozen Wiggly Gigglies. <laughs> so I now have 13 Wiggly Gigglies in my office. Um, so let me explain what a supercritical fluid is. You have to imagine, this is a real experiment, but I'm going to show in video. Imagine a small vessel that has a liquid here with a gas above it. And the vessel is sealed, so nothing can get in or out. And so let me show you now what happens if you heat it. 
So if you heat it, the liquid begins to boil, and material goes from the liquid phase to the gas phase, but because the gas can't get out, it gets denser and denser, and the liquid expands so it gets less dense, and eventually the density becomes the same. So you have a highly compressed gas, the supercritical fluid, and when you cool it down, it separates again in a sort of storm, which I think is really very beautiful. And I keep this apparatus in my office, and um, I use it to demonstrate to people who might be interested in doing research in our research group. And if they look at it and say, wow, I know that they're suitable. If they look bored, I suggest they should go and work with Professor X or Y, but not with me. And um, so then um, <clears throat> I demonstrated this with my colleagues, Mike George and Steve Howdle, at the Royal Society Summer Exhibition. If you live in London, the Royal Society Summer Exhibition, which takes place every year in the first week of July, is a really terrific exhibition. It's the only science exhibition in our country where you can talk to the researchers who've actually done the research. And here you can see us at the formal soiree in the evening. It was before I had a periodic table bow tie. But, um, and the title was putting the fizz into chemistry because CO2 also makes fizzy drinks. And then this was in 2002. In 2004, we got funding from the um, <coughs> Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, which funded a post which we called Public Awareness Scientist. And um, Dr. Samantha Tang joined, first of all, our research group and now our School of Chemistry to help the academics explain their research to the public. And so we could do much more ambitious things. Um, as you already know, I'm at the University of Nottingham. And this is the Victoria Shopping Centre, which is the big shopping centre in the centre of Nottingham. And um, I can't remember what the equivalent is in London, Westfield or whatever. And so you have to imagine... Just before Christmas, there is Santa's Grotto, and the children go into Santa's Grotto, and there's a bad-tempered old man sitting there, and they come out feeling really depressed, and then, wow, there's supercritical fluids, and the day is saved. <laughs> and here you can see Sam Tang describing essentially the same experiment you saw on video to this young girl explaining what supercritical fluid is. So this was in 2005. And then <clears throat> three years later, my university started a YouTube channel called Test Tube, And I was asked to describe um, this experiment on the um, YouTube video. Um, this is quite an old screen grab, so this number of views here, you get obsessed with these numbers on YouTube. It's like if you're selling something on eBay, you look at the price. So this number here is approaching 300,000 now. Um, and I became <coughs> really very friendly with Brady Harron, the video journalist who made the video. So here's a picture of me and braided together, a rather strange selfie. And after a few weeks after this supercritical video was made, Brady came to me and said he had had a really interesting idea. He wanted to make a video about each of the 118 elements on the periodic table. And so I told him he was mad. And the reason I told him he was mad is that it's easy to make a video about sodium or hydrogen. They explode. You can make it visually exciting. But what do you do about an element like element 117, which 
at that time, in 2008, not a single atom of this element had ever been synthesized or seen. How can you make a video about an element that doesn't exist? So we had quite a bit of to and throwing, but eventually he persuaded me it was worth trying. So we made a website with the periodic table. This is element 117 here. And the idea is that you click on any of these elements and you get a video about it. So if you click on hydrogen, you get a video about hydrogen with the predictable explosion. And <clears throat> so let me just show you trailer we made to sort of show the sort of things we had on this video, or on this website. So this sample, it's a very, very interesting sample. It's arsenic. This is a duo of liquid nitrogen, and you can see that the nitrogen is evaporating from the top. That's brilliant. The per stands for perborate, and the S sil stands for silicate. Oh, oh, it's on your camera. One of my colleagues who used to work with it described it as evil. The phosphorus is oxidized in the air to generate a nice P for phosphorus. Because it has a coating of oxide on the surface. Now it's packed in argon because argon is very, very inert. It doesn't react with anything. Ever since this, I get quite excited. I can see lots and lots of lines in the blue and the green region, and these are all specific to the individual atoms. This one just has more data than you could possibly want. You can see the different grain sizes. And you can imagine the periodic table a bit like a family photograph. And there she blows! <laughs> In order to make this, I had to find some money. And it was the, near the end of the financial year, so the money had to be spent very quickly. So we began on sun, uh, June, the first filming on June the 9th. 2008, and it was finished on July the 17th, 2008, so that's five weeks. And we made 120 videos, that's one for each of the 118 elements, and the trailer you just saw, and an introduction. And the total running time was um, four hours, seven minutes, which, to put in context, is the length of two blockbuster movies or three arty French movies. So it's, quite, um, so it's quite a lot. And so <clears throat> and we started getting comments on our videos. People posted them on YouTube. Um, the first, these are three that I like. Um, this was one of the early ones. Awesome vids, wish I had found them before I did my GCSE exam. Now, the interesting thing about this is you can't tell whether this is a 16-year-old who's just blown his chemistry exam or a 40-year-old who is regretting a misspent youth. And then there's this one. I love your videos. Just watching these videos, I've learned more than a full term at college. And um, then this one's a bit more serious. Videos like these is what makes me interested in school and better improving myself. Thank you. Um, now, you probably know that the summer is the time when newspapers have nothing to write about. So these videos got a surprisingly large amount of um, press coverage. So. Um, I'm slightly embarrassed that it appeared in the Daily Mail. And um, then this is in Chemical and Engineering News, which is a major um, American chemistry journal. This is a Russian business magazine. I did not realize that the, uh, that the BBC had a Turkish service, but you can see this is in Turkish. And... This was from an Israeli magazine, and I don't read um, 
Yivrit, but I had this translated. And apparently, the key sentence says, looks as if he went into a barber's and said, give me an Einstein, but make it wild. <laughs> and um, so, so there was a lot of interest in this. But we also had a lot of comments which said something like this one, I don't care what they do as long as they keep making videos. So we were suddenly in the situation where we'd started what we thought was a nice quick project for the summer and found it had become an ongoing activity. And um, so we had to start making more videos. And I don't know if you remember, 2008 was year of the Olympic Games. So it was fairly obvious to make a video about gold, silver, and bronze. Bronze is not an element. It's an alloy of copper and something else. And that had 40,000 views in two months, so we were quite excited. Then the Large Hadron Collider started leaking helium, so we made a video which had <clears throat> nearly 70,000 views in two weeks. And then the Nobel Prize in 2008, we made the video and it got nearly 40,000 views. And then we started making all sorts of other videos. Our most successful video, I'm ashamed to say, is putting a cheeseburger, a McDonald's cheeseburger, in concentrated hydrochloric acid. <laughs> and this had 5 million hits in 21 days and has got up now to more than 17 million views. So this is more than voted for Brexit. Hmm? And, um, the, um, and then we went to the Bank of England, to the Gold Bullion Vault, quite close to here, and we had 2 million hits in 15 days. And um, it's quite exciting. It looks exactly like um, the duty-free in an airport except what would normally be Toblerone bars are really gold. And we made video on candles at Halloween that was watched by nearly a quarter of a million people in three days. And then for Chinese New Year, we had tea chemistry. And so the number of YouTube subscribers has, um, on <clears throat> the 13th, which was Monday at... 13 minutes to 9, was 893,904 subscribers. Um, and this number is considerably more than the UK royal family, Chelsea Football Club, and um, Doctor Who have on their respective YouTube channels. And we started travelling. So this is me wearing the same time I'm wearing now, in the control room of the Heavy Iron Research Center in Darmstadt, where they synthesized element <coughs> 111, which in my view has the worst name on the periodic table, at least for um, speakers of English, because Rintgenium is very difficult to pronounce. It just doesn't roll off the Tang Röntgen, if you remember, was the scientist who discovered X-rays. Um, then we bought a high-speed camera so we could video exploding balloons with hydrogen and other things at high speed. Very interestingly, if you put a match to a hydrogen balloon, it goes bang. But the balloon, you can see there's a bit of it here, the balloon disappears before the fire starts. It whizzes off, just mechanically it goes off here. If you fill the balloon with hydrogen and oxygen, the, it's quite different. The balloon lights up like a light bulb when you put the match. And also, interestingly, you can see it forms two blobs with a match in the middle. This is one of our innovations. At Nottingham is called the match on the stick, which is what it says it is. And then, for example, we included things at the university. We had new teaching labs in 2015, 
And we found a photograph of students in a lab in 1935, and we got some students, of our present students, to try and replicate this while explaining what the difference between the lab there and there. One of the obvious differences is that there are women here, which they were not in the lab in 1935. And then we started making videos about molecules. Um, cheeseburger is not a molecule. It's, <laughs> well, it's made of molecules, but um, this is HCL and so on. And we went to various places to make videos about molecules. This is me on Bondi Beach in Australia um, with my tie, different period, and the wiggly giggly. Um, any ideas which um, molecule this was a video about? No, silica is, is a good idea. Sand is made from silica. We made a video about silica on Copacabana Beach in Rio de Janeiro. <laughs> so this is actually about the ozone layer and how chlorofluorocarbons, aerosol propellants, were threatening the ozone layer. And I was so engrossed that I never noticed these women behind me at all. So we've also done videos on our research. We still do photochemistry. And we recently, 18 months ago, published a paper on making this molecule, which is called artemisinin, which is quite a powerful anti-malarial drug. And the, um, we've got a lot of interesting comments from viewers about this. These are the actual crystals of artemisinin. So we've also been working with the EdTed work, um, website to make what we've called the periodic table of lessons. So it's another periodic table, and you can click on any of the elements, and you get a lesson about that element, which is quite useful for school teachers. So they, the pupils watch the video, and then there are questions that they can answer. But what makes this quite exciting for school teachers is that if they register on the site, they can then tailor the questions to their particular class. They don't even have to be in English. They can put them, and so they can adapt it so you could have different questions for GCSE students and A-level students or whatever. So um, our colleagues at Nottingham in the physics department have started another uh, uh, sister channel on um, physics called 60 Symbols. There isn't a periodic table in physics. So they invented one, which was inspired by those of you who use Microsoft Word will know that if you try and insert a symbol, a sort of little thing comes out full of symbols. So this is the physicist view of symbols. And what is it? This has been very successful. And also our colleagues in computing have started another channel called Computer File. They haven't tried to make a periodic table of computers. Um, I have done a small number of videos for, um, for the 60 symbols. I've done one video for Computer File because I had a toy of a called a Smacker Mac, which is a sort of soft, cuddly Macintosh computer of the old sort. And I made a video about this. And um, the idea was those computers were not very reliable. So when they crashed, you could throw this Smacker Mac across the room and relieve your frustrations. So this comes out to the question which you have to ask about all scientific communication, are you making any impact? And this is not terribly easy to judge. And Brady, my video collaborator, and I wrote a, video, uh, wrote a paper in the journal um, Nature Chemistry, it's now six years ago, um, trying to assess, uh, 
discuss how you might dis, um, assess impact. And the first thing you can look at is the number of views on the video. And the number of views, if you think about it, is probably not a very good measure because you cannot distinguish between, on one hand, a teacher showing a video to a whole class of children, which might be 30 or, in some countries, even 50 children. So you have that on one hand. The other hand, you have somebody who is drunk and feeling sad, who sits <coughs> in his garret watching the same video over and over again. And such people exist. Early on, we had a an email which said, I'm in New York, I am drunk, I have just watched all your videos twice. <laughs> so the next thing is you can look at the number of subscribers, one number I showed you, and you can compare this with other channels. So you can say, we've got more than the royal family or whatever. But you can, for your own channel, you can look at the rate at which people unsubscribe. They decide that having taken out a subscription, which just means they get alerts when a new video is posted, that they decide it's not for them. And for us, the number of people who unsubscribe is about 10%. But you can't tell how many unsubscribe from other channels, so it's not a very good comparison. So we came up eventually that the idea that although it's not very rigorous, in some ways what is most indicative is actually to look at the comments that we get in emails and letters and um, also on YouTube um, from, from viewers. So this is quite a recent one. That's 13 days ago. It's an email I got. My name is Mike Campbell. I'm writing to thank you from Halifax, Canada. My elder son, Ewan, has developed a great interest in science, so I found your app and let him explore. He loves it, has learned so much, and really seeks to understand the chemistry. He watches your videos over and over, really enjoys them, and truly learns from them. And I get emails like this, not every day, but several times a week. And my favorite um, email ever said which came from the States. Um, I never took chemistry in school, but I've enormously enjoyed these videos. I work in the high school in the US. I'm a janitor. For, for those of you in the front, janitor means caretaker. I will give your website to the science department. I'm sure it will be used in their classes. And I feel that if we're getting janitors in schools telling the school teachers how to teach science, this is quite something. Now, if you believe that you have discovered a new element or synthesized a new element, in the old days, you just said, chaps, I have discovered columbium or whatever, and you just plucked a name out of the air. Nowadays, you have to put your evidence to a committee. So I got this comment, an email, <clears throat> which said, Prof. Polyakov, I just watched your video on the new elements 114, 116, and found it exceptionally well done, accurate, and insightful. What a delight. And this is from Paul J. Carroll, who is the chair of the Joint Committee of the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry and Pure and Applied Physics, who decides whether the new element has really been synthesized or not. So this was really quite encouraging. And as you can imagine, with my hair, um, I'm quite easily recognizable. But let me just, before I tell you that, point out that you can do an analysis of the comments on YouTube with what is called a Wordle. A Wordle takes, you take a mass of text, and it picks out the top 100 words and the more frequent they are, the bigger the word. So you can see there's like and video. And love is quite big, if I can find it. Chemistry is quite big here. And somewhat surprisingly, hair is quite big there. <laughs> so it is generally very positive. 
Um, this is one of our fans. He's somewhat older than this now, called Eddie. And his mother wrote to us and said that she was unemployed in um, Arkansas. And Eddie was a huge fan. And would we send a photo for a Christmas present? So this is the photo we got back of Eddie about to open his Christmas present. And here he is having got the Christmas present. And our feeling was that <clears throat> unless the mother was really sadistic, she couldn't have faked this picture. So he really was enjoying it. Um, and this is our youngest viewer, or at the time was our youngest viewer, who's 18 months old in Denmark. And this shot comes from a video that we made about photos of our viewers. And I said on the video that I found this photo very disturbing. <laughs> and the father posted a comment in reply saying it was quite all right the gun had been in the family for a long time, which I'm not sure is a very good excuse. And this is by far our most faithful fan, who's called Nagayasu Nawa, who's a school teacher on the southernmost island of Japan. I mean, not Okinawa, but of the um, Japan. And I met him exactly two, a year ago in Tokyo, and he brought this extraordinary coat for me, which I now have in Nottingham, which is called the Happy. And it has the periodic table on it. And in fact, with the discovery of the new elements or the naming of the last four elements on the periodic table, he sent me a new updated happy, which I now have two in Nottingham. So as I was saying, I meet fans, or I'm accosted by fans all over the world, and this is a small selection of the people I met last year. So I met a diner in a restaurant in Helsinki in Finland. Then... A few weeks, days later, I was in Tallinn Airport in Estonia, and my flight had just been cancelled, and I was really angry. I went into the gents, I was accosted by a fan, and felt greatly cheered up. And by, by the time I came out, they had reorganised my flight. I was accosted by a couple in the Châtelet metro station in Paris. I was YouTube cannot officially be watched in China. I was crossing a street in Beijing at night, and the cyclist stopped and said, Professor Polyakov, I really like your videos. And then just before Christmas in Nottingham, I was buying a Christmas tree, and the young man selling me the Christmas tree turned out to be a fan. So I got two pounds off the Christmas tree without asking. And perhaps the most extraordinary was on flight BA084 from Vancouver to London last March. And about an hour out from London, when I was sort of, for me, early morning, I was just waking up. The captain of the plane, you know who should be at the flight deck, um, appeared next to my seat and addressed me by name and said his father was a huge fan of the videos and asked for a selfie. So here he is with a selfie. And I think there's a very nice contrast of hairstyles in this. Um, so, um, so now let me just in the last few minutes before we start discussing, try and summarize sort of some general points about public engagement. I think that the really important things about public engagement First of all, the scientist has to be enthusiastic. If the scientist isn't enthusiastic about what is being done, how can one expect that the public will be enthusiastic? And I think also the scientist has to enjoy things, because if you don't enjoy them, then why should other people think it's interesting? But most importantly, you have to be honest. And one of the problems with some of these science programs you see on television, uh, they're rigged. They pretend that something is exploding, but they've actually put quite a substantial 
charge of gunpowder or whatever in it to make it more exciting or whatever. So if your experiment doesn't work, you should be honest about it. And there is always a question, should you be demonstrating science live in a lecture or should you be doing it online? So obviously, the great thing about doing it live is that you can interact with the audience. You've been a very good audience, laughed at jokes and so on, so it's very good. The other thing is that things can go wrong in a way that you can't fudge. Well, with the Royal Institution Christmas lectures, they can edit them out, but when I'm doing it live to an audience, you can't. But on the other hand, there's safety constraints. Here I am in a lecture theatre where there are a lot of flammable things, and so there are a lot of experiments you'd like to do which we couldn't do. And the number of people are relatively small, even if the lecture theatre is packed. So if you think about online, you're completely remote from the audience. You can perhaps respond to the odd comment on a YouTube video, but even with a huge number of viewers, you may only get a few hundred comments. People often find it hard to believe. They think, particularly now when you have all these um, films with CGI and so on, if you see something on screen, you can never tell whether it's really genuine. And you have to be responsible if you're doing things online. You have to be responsible. You're constrained by safety in the live lecture theatre, but you mustn't just say, look, you can blow things up like this because people might start doing them in their back gardens or wherever. And you have a huge reach. There have been many occasions in the last um, few years where in one night, on, while I've been asleep, more people have watched a YouTube video in which I'm talking than everybody I've ever lectured to in my entire life, live. So you have a big reach. So the next thing is that when people make videos, on, they feel, often feel they should have very serious educational objectives. You know, you have the equivalent of lesson plans and so on. In our videos, and we've now made 611 videos. In none of them have we, have we had a script. And our aim is to, if they're of use to teachers, it's just to help teachers to do their job, not to teach a specific topic or whatever. And anyway, the syllabus is so different, say, in Sri Lanka from Canada or England that you couldn't possibly cover all the syllabuses. But really want to get the message to say that science is worthwhile and even more fun than you think. So we were really quite pleased because New Scientist had a blog uh, on the 4th of January this year, and which was on science communication. And the leading picture was a still from one of our videos. You can see me here cowering in the background. And, um, but what was really nice, it had the caption saying, some of the best science communication is being done on online videos, periodic videos, which was obviously quite excited. So this is our team of people with Brady, our video journalist, in the middle. And I would particularly like to highlight our technician, Neil Barnes. And Neil, at the end of last year, won the Royal Society of Chemistry Presidential Award for, <clears throat> in a large part for his work on these videos. He is like the Stig in Top Gear. He does not speak. He merely performs. And... Um, as far as I know, this may be the only time that a technician has won this presidential award. So here are the names of our colleagues and our website. And obviously, we need to thank the people who have funded our, research, our YouTube videos. 
Finding money to support these videos is always a um, problem. So I shall stick the £20 note back together again. And so if you know people who would be interested in funding us, please refer them to us. And I thought I would end by showing you a video which gives you a better idea of our more modern videos, which was <coughs> done about 18 months ago to celebrate our 500th video. Are you ready? Go. I should look at you rather than all, all the camera. Let's give it a go. So, welcome to our periodic table videos. This is an experiment for me, just as much as it will be for you when you're watching. Your mind is a bit like soup. It has to be stirred up all the time. And then interesting vegetables float to the surface. And What's the next element? Hassium. I know nothing about Hassium. Should we make something up? This is a seriously toxic molecule. I didn't expect it to be quite so... Wow! So you can probably hear it hissing and fizzing into the bottle there. Pop, and I think you got the pop. Oh, it's on your camera. Oh, it is too. 25 is manganese. This is what took quite a while. What's going on there? this periodic table. It was installed here 10 years after Levy's death. Good old McDonald's cheeseburger. We, we need more elements. <laughs> <laughs> so this isn't the first cast I've had on. Got to keep hold of it. Four, three, two, one. <laughs> well, you lose it, you know. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Lovely. We're currently in the Chercolo de la Torre. We're in Turin. It's nice sunny weather in Stockholm. We're here at the Institute of Heavy Iron Research, the birthplace of six elements. I'm here in Mumbai. So here we are on the summit of the Kolkata Bondi Beach in Sydney. <laughs> I'm sitting here, possibly in the seat that he sat in, more than enough to make over 300 standard tablets of Viagra. So I've got my wiggly giggly. I'm here at Mount Everest Space Camp. And those guys behind me are boiling water for you at periodic videos. Woo! That's really sweet. Just there. We're going to need a bigger boat. We're in the vault, the bullion vault of the Bank of England. And I'm really excited. I've never seen so much gold. In fact, I've never seen so much of any <laughs> element. You can imagine the periodic table a bit like a family photograph. So, thank you.